Okay, um, this, in part three of this week's content, I'm going to um, use the, um, think, uh, the, the example of graffiti and street art to think through some of the kind of uh, concepts that I've been unpacking already, um, but also to kind of, again, try and make the normal look strange in that sociological sense to, to think a little bit about um, something that's almost mundane and everyday in our lives. You see it everywhere um, and, and draw out some kind of the wider meanings um, around that kind of thing. So um, if to begin with, I've uh, provided you some, some links in the lecture notes there to some various videos and documentaries. Um, the first one is actually just a little sound cloud of me talking on ABC Radio a year or two ago about um, graffiti and street tags and street um, tags and stuff like that. Um, there's a couple of uh, there's a an article there about the NOS controversy that I'll talk about in a minute, and some um, some documentaries that you can um, check out as well. Um, so you know, when it comes to graffiti and street art, I think we all pretty much know what it. You know, we can all kind of picture it. Um, it ranges from you know, things like tagging um, through to kind of, you know, I suppose, you know, council endorsed murals and things like that. Um, so in, in recent times in Australia, it's been quite in the news as well. Um, there's been the, 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 the Kanye um, one there where the Melbourne graffiti artist Lushix um, painted, who tends to uh, paint um, celebrities in his street heart in various ironic ways and um, often uses forms of intertextuality where he uh, combines kind of different um, references into it to kind of, you know, ironically satirise whatever's going on. Um, he painted this huge moral of Kanye West kissing himself. Apparently Kanye West was so angry that he contacted him and offered him 50 grand to paint over it, which apparently he took. Um, so well done. <laughs> You know, you never know how true those kind of things are, but it was reported fairly widely. Um, the other example there is a uh, controversy that happened around the um, Melbourne graffiti artist Nost. Um, you can see there there's a there was a really famous and long-standing feminist mural, I think, in the in the the, the north of um, the inner north of Melbourne. Nost painted that huge tag over it, and there was a huge uproar about whether this was misogynist or not. Um, you know, and you know, Nost has been prominent in basically painting over lots of things throughout the past ten years as a kind of form of symbolic resistance in many ways. Um, so there's a little story there that in the previous thing that you can check out if you're interested in the controversy around that. What I find really interesting there is the is the little photo in between the large Nost and the Kanye is a actually a, a council worker um, painting over tags that are on the huge tag. Um, so it seems, you know, even other graffiti artists come along and tag over that stuff, which is a, is a whole politics and um, a whole symbolic politics around that kind of stuff within um, graffiti subculture. So there's, there's some examples there of it. So there's many ways to think about this, you know, what graffiti is in a broader societal context. Um, you know, it, it's generally been um, researched and, and graffiti artists themselves have, have argued that it's a form of symbolic resistance. Um, particularly, it's tended to be done by people from very disadvantaged backgrounds. And the, the last couple of slides, I'll talk about that, particularly around uh, Kevin McDonald's amazing um, research with disadvantaged young people. One of the chapters with about, um, was about graffiti artists. Um, and the idea here is, is that um, street art, tagging and stuff like that is a way of taking back public space. Public space is increasingly commercialised. It's all about production and consumption. Um, the, there's an argument here done by many graffiti artists that says that this is a way of kind of taking that kind of, you know, capitalist um, dominance back, and you know, having some autonomy, showing some resistance, um, performing versions of subversion to be on those things. Um, so what's interesting about this, you know, throughout the late '90s, early 2000s, there was culture jamming. I've got some examples of that there. Um, this is this is kind of an, almost a development of graffiti culture, where people were you know um, uh, reappropriating billboards in particular, as billboards come and advertising comes to dominate public space. Culture Jam has started to you know play with those things, play with the very symbols of consumer culture, and try and twist them, reappropriate them, um, re-represent them, I suppose, to try and uncover some of the actual hidden meanings underneath the shiny surface of consume culture. But as, um, you know, analysis of this shows, you know, 
um, like any good subculture, it tends to be what we call co-opted, that the um, resistive and subversive elements you know, of a subculture often get taken out of it, and the spectacular symbolic and aesthetic um, parts of the subculture get used by you know, um, capitalism to sell, you know, sell a product to, to back at a higher price. So, you know, punk has been seen as a good example of this. It kind of rise in the mid-70s. Um, you know, it was a way of kind of resisting dominant norms and it kind of gets co-opted, you know, to now where, you know, the Mohawk is kind of, you know, David Beckham had one and, you know, your punk bands kind of can be seen as, you know, things like Good Charlotte and Blink-182. Um, when it comes to graffiti, you can see the very aesthetic of graffiti being um, co-opted into things like advertising. You see stencil art now that are actually ads for things and you know chalkboard menus and, and stuff like that. What's also interesting here is graffiti art is also has been increasingly incorporated and co-opted into council and government um, um, activities. And so again, in terms of the contextual nature of deviance, um, graffiti isn't always deviant. Um, if it's done in the right place with the right permit these days and under the right conditions and supervision. Um, it can be seen as a positive thing and people talk about it as a kind of positive po um, uh, public good that can, you know, beautify the, uh, the, um, the area or whatever. So there's a really interesting development there in terms of aesthetics or what was seen as outsider and ugly. Um, and vandalism is now being incorporated in forms of kind of in, in ways to beautify a public space. So the Hit the Bricks example, uh, uh, thing in Newcastle is a good example and Hosea Lane in Melbourne, which is now a kind of tourist attraction. Um, is good. So you can see here the context here, and largely based around class. Um, those that have access to the cultural and symbolic capital that can get the waivers, can get the permits, can approach a council and you know all that kind of stuff, that's fine. Um, if it's street art in a gallery, that's fine as well. But if it's done by people outside of those kind of more legitimate realms in public space, it's seen as vandalism. Again, in terms of labelling and you know the context here, very, very similar act, you know, graffiti art means very different things in different contexts. So I think Banksy is the most prominent example of this. Um, you know, started in London putting up stencil art as a way of um, symbolising dissent, you know, um, making overt political uh, commentary. He did a really, I think, a, a great piece of kind of civil disobedience when he went into a really prominent art gallery and put up one of his own artworks, um, again, to make a kind of statement in terms of what I'm talking about now, that out in the street, street art's seen as vandalism, but like, you know, if it's something's inside the walls of a gallery, it's deemed as art, and you know, you think about much contemporary art, how, you know, absurd some of it is, it can be a pile of junk, but if it's in the wall of a museum, it can be deemed as art. Banksy was kind of making a, a comment on those, um, you know, power knowledge uh, relationships. Uh, very interestingly though, once Banksy became famous, that art gallery put that artwork back up. Um, so it's a good example of the kind of co-optation that goes on here. Um, so he's still making, you know, uh, artworks. He's very controversial. Um, he's, there's links there to um, recent work on Dismal Land. He, he made this kind of hotel on the Gaza Strip, which has been both praised as a great piece of dissent, but also criticised as being taking advantage of the suffering of people in that area. So again, these artistic statements are you know, thoroughly engaged with critically from all perspectives. And what's interesting, you know, as he's become more famous, now his work is, is sold for huge sums of money. So there's a really interesting, interesting um, documentary about when Banksy made an announcement that he was gonna do an artwork, one, one artwork a day for a month in New York and how there was these crews of people kind of trying to find out where, where they were going to be and get there first so they could basically take them down and sell them for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. The other interesting thing to think about this kind of symbolic resistance is, is he really just preaching to the converted? Are people that are interested in Banksy already kind of more likely to be lefties and interested in that to begin with? So a little example here recently is this, this piece of, um, of tagging here. And again, it's kind of the opposite of what Bagsy did. Uh, sorry, not Bagsy, Banksy did. Um, someone's uh, put up a kind of museum-like label next to that piece of, um, of tagging to kind of explain, um, you know, through this you know, artistic language, what it means. So it's a kind of nice piece of, I think, sociological 
um, culture jamming going on there. In terms of some specific Australian work on um, graffiti, um, the work of Alison Young and Mark Housley, both together and separately, has been um, really important here. Um, and they um, analyse, you know, graffiti and street art and stuff like that from a multiple kind of through multiple prisms and th uh, and uh, from I suppose a Borgesian perspective, what it means in multiple fields fields from you know public space to law to art to the kind of day to day lives of the people who are doing it. Uh, their work with graffiti artists and taggers has been particularly I think interesting to think about the motivations of what what people, uh, particularly disadvantaged people that do this, do it for. And they show there's an array of things, of kind of motivations and reasons that people do it. It can be about aesthetic tastes. It can be about kind of sharing an outsider status, um, both as a way of um, um, separating yourself from the mainstream, but also as a way of um, sharing and identifying yourself with other people in um, similar social situations as you. Others talk about it's a reaction to boredom, of being kind of, you know, um, in, in an entrenched unemployment, a form of rebellion. There's also kind of people that talk about it as a thrill, you know, taking risks, doing this stuff in public space. And others talk about it that within this, the kind of graffiti subculture, there's a whole kind of symbolic politics going on, a kind of, in a way, a kind of struggle over cultural capital to display one's skills and to gain status within that subculture. So there you can kind of see here, like, something like tagging, from you know outside the subculture is seen as a form of vandalism, but within it, you know, there's forms of actual conformity going on, and there's competition going on that uh, looks quite strange from the outside, I suppose. Many of the respondents and participants in their research shows that they actually the the, the artists see what they're doing as art and not vandalism, and they interpret blank space not as private property, but but as blank space. Here, walls of buildings and billboards and trains and stuff like that are up for grabs. They're there to be kind of used for one's purposes in public space because they argue that public space is for everyone, not just corporations and not just businesses. Some of the um, participants talk about how breaking the law is part of the thrill, that kind of carnivalist transgression. Um, and that's kind of, again, that rite of passage thing where young people you know, do kind of take risks as a thrill, as a kind of way of pushing the boundaries. But they show that this isn't really the primary motivation. It tends to be more about kind of expressing um, status frustration and overt kind of forms of politics of, um, of resistance and um, alienation. They also, both Young and Helsley have done research about local, with local council representatives. And, and they show how, you know, the people work, working in quite legitimate institutions struggle with the complex issues around graffiti and around the politics of it where you know even um, some of the legitimate you know uh, street art done through things like hit the bricks many people don't like it and they complain to the council about it as well so there's this kind of constant um, social debate going on within that realm about what's viewed as vandalism or not and some people start accusing the councils of being vandals themselves by actually putting up this um, and, and supporting this kind of street art and, uh, and that has been the case in Newcastle around Hit the Bricks as well. I live in Cooks Hill and there's some um, artworks around there and a couple that I think are quite awesome, but I know that some of my neighbours, particularly some of the older ones, um, you know, don't see it that way and they, they don't appreciate it. They do much prefer the, the brick walls to be unmarked. So there you can see a lot of kind of class stuff going on between, you know, taste, between what's deemed as art, between what's deemed as authentic and the politics of public space. Graffiti, you know, just shining a light on an act like, on a practice of graffiti can, you know, shine a light and get us an understanding of all those things. Um, and Kevin McDonald's work uh, around struggles for subjectivity, I think, is a really good um, um, way of thinking about this. Uh, McDonald did interviews with um, young people in Melbourne mostly, I think, um, and he, there's chapters in it about um, so there's some drug addicts and. Um, um, and graffiti writers, and I can't remember what the other other group of kind of disenfranchised young people were, but it's a really excellent book. I, I strongly suggest you check it out if you're interested in this topic. Um, and McDonald does uh, he interviews them, um, and you know deep interviews about you know why they participate in these things. 
And he highlights that, you know, at the center of these kind of struggles for subjectivity that he sees um, graffiti and tagging as being apart, at the center of these experiences are questions of identity, um, modes of the way that people are kind of striving for recognition, particularly people that don't have legitimate recognition from the kind of mainstream um, legitimate institutions of society, and a struggle and a game about the search for visibility in urban spaces in particular. They, uh, McDonald's work about tagging in particular, and a lot of people kind of make a distinction between tagging and graffiti and street art. Tagging in particular seems to be the one that gains the most antimony. Uh, people tend to dislike it a lot. They see it mostly as just vandalism. For the people doing it, they have kind of deeply held in, you know, intrinsic socially kind of um, reasons for doing this stuff. So again, this is kind of a way of thinking about that through that kind of Chicago through school subcultural lens that um, what look, from the outside can look like a form of destruction, from the inside is a form of creativity, a form of um, you know, seeking authenticity, of seeking recognition, seeking a way of kind of constructing a form of identity. So you can see I've got some interview quotes there from the book, you know, the more you see the same tag, the more you remember it, and if it's good, you won't be forgotten. And that's what everyone wants, people to see them. What happens if you stop putting up your tag? Zepp says, you'll be forgotten. Here there's a kind of symbolic politics, um, an effective kind of presence in public space done by these young people that feel like they don't have any presence. Um, they feel like they're ostracised um, out of the labour markets and education systems. Um, so I was bombing a train, some guy was sitting there and he had the right clothes, so I start bombing and, he, and so would he. You call him by his tag, if you get to know them you start to go over to their house, you start to call them by their name. Here again, that subcultural idea that rather than being a place of deviance, these subcultures are a place for people who identify with each other from similar backgrounds, with similar, similar problems, with similar tastes, and they form communities of support um, to try and you know, minimise risk and to have some kind of um, social relations with other people like them. Okay, so that's the kind of end of the case study that I want to talk about with graffiti. Um, um, throughout the three parts of the lecture today, I've touched upon notions, um, sociological notions of deviance, um, related those specifically to young people, and done a case study on to try and draw some of those things out empirically with the idea, with the example of uh, graffiti. Okay, thanks. <laughs>